Thank you everyone for joining us for this launch of my new online course and the republication of my book uh, co-authored with uh, Dr. Pavan Dingra, uh, Asian America. And the course that I'm launching will be uh, largely based on the book, but also on my own research, personal experiences, growing up Asian American, and also my experiences as a community organizer. So again, thank you all for taking time out of your evening to hear a little bit about this course, the journey uh, that I have been taking towards doing this, uh, this new work and uh, just listening in too on my conversation today with Adriel Lewis, who I will introduce shortly. But before I go into that, I just want to take a moment and do a land acknowledgement. I'm currently living on and striving to be a very mindful steward of Plains Miwok land that's usually known as the greater Sacramento region. I've spent most of my growing up though on Ohlone land in the East Bay, specifically Union City, California, a connection I share with Adriel. My ancestors come from the provinces of Aklan, Capiz, Pangasinan, and Ilocosur uh, in what is now called the Philippines. Adra Lewis is coming from what many of you know as Venice, California. The Tongva name for this area is uh, Sangna, and the LA area generally is called Tovaangar. Other native peoples who've called uh, that area home are the Chumash and Kiz Gabrielino. So again, I'm just really, really excited to welcome you to this launch to welcome you to this conversation I'm having with Adriel. And let me go ahead and introduce Adriel. Adriel, again, thank you so much for being part of this conversation and being part of this launch. Um, again, I just, I, I've said this to you in email, I've said this to you in, um, in the conversation right uh, before we officially started, how I feel like there is nobody more uh, perfect than you to moderate this conversation as I take this step to really bringing Asian American out of the university into, into the community where I've always felt it belongs. So Adriel Lewis is a community organizer, artist, writer, and curator who believes that collective liberation can happen in poetic ways. His life's work is focused on the mutual thriving of artistic integrity and social vigilance. He is part of the Illiteracy Arts Collective, which creates music and media to strengthen Black and Asian coalitions, and is creative director of Bombshell Toe, a collaborative of artists and leaders from frontline communities responding to nuclear histories. Adriel is also the curator of digital and emerging practice at the Smithsonian Asian Pacific American Center, where he advocates for equitable practices in museums and institutions. His ancestors are rooted in Toisan, China, and migrated through Hong Kong, Mexico, and the United States. Adriel was born on Ohlone land. So, um, you know, Adriel and I actually met on BART, and I think we met, <laughs> I think it must have been maybe just a few months into my new job at UC Davis. I had uh, wow. I was at Rutgers in New Jersey teaching in the sociology department. And then all of a sudden, what I thought was my dream job opened up, which is this opportunity to teach Philippine X studies at, in an Asian American studies department at UC Davis, which would bring me back home. And I think I met you, it must have been really like the first quarter when I started teaching at, at UC Davis. And I just remember just being so... Um, energized from the conversation and and just connecting right away after because I felt like there was just so much synergy between us of course you um you know part of the bio that we didn't necessarily mention is that you're an alumnus of UC Davis and specifically of Asian American studies we're so proud of you and um you know and then we had also made that connection of course that we came up a lot, our growing up um, was done in, in Ohlone land, of course, but what we both knew as Union City, uh, California growing up. So yeah, it's just so great to, again, to, to, to have you as part of this conversation. You know, I mean, one of the things too about you, Adriel, is just, I've been so, um, you know, of course we've had this chance to 
uh, build on that initial meeting and to, to connect and kind of collab, right? Um, we first, uh, you connected me to other folks creating community archives and who are also developing curriculum, especially for K through 12 um, uh, educators around some of these archival correct uh, collections. So, you know, you and I reconnected, I think, after our first meeting, especially around um, the Welga archive, which is the big archive that we host at the Belusan Center for Philippine Studies. And thanks to you, we got featured right in the Learning Together Project House that's on the Smithsonian Asia Pacific American Center's website. But then we've been collect connecting too around Asian American Studies at UC Davis because of your personal connection there, um, having graduated from there. I mean, I remember, and I still have, um, and I think by now they've already been digitized, but you had contributed those awesome, um, the material, um, archival material from your own organizing um, and your own work uh, in uh, on the campus as a student organizer and as a uh, up and coming artist uh, at the time. And, and we have that as part of the department's uh, archive. Of course, you were great talking to our students. I, if I'm recalling correctly, you came through and, and did just an amazingly inspirational speech for our grads, the, the first set of grads who had to, to graduate through COVID in 2020, connected to students in that way. And again, you know, I've so valued you as a thought partner. I just feel like whenever I talk to you, we end up talking for hours. <laughs> about all the wonderful things Asian American studies can be. And I love dreaming with you. I mean, I, we've talked in the past about potential um, interesting collaborations, artistic and intellectual collaborations around Asian American agriculture. Of course, for me, I've been so inspired by the Culture Lab manifesto. And I feel like um, it's so much of the manifesto echoes what I think Asian American studies or ethnic studies more broadly ought to be. And it it really, um, I think, shapes how I am thinking about what I want to do with Asian American studies in the, the launch of this online course and this longer, maybe not so longer term vision I have of creating an, a school for liberating a, um, education where I can really take Asian American studies knowledge, ethnic studies knowledge, and really put it out in the world. And again, I think the, the cultural labs um, principles have been really inspiring. Um, I found them really inspiring, you know, this idea that we have to have a culture of memory, a culture of representation. I love this idea, right? Cultural representation, prioritizing local artists, participants, and organizers, nothing about communities without those communities, um, a, a culture of ambition and evolution, a culture of imagination that is so um, vital, placing value on daydreaming. Not everything is a logistic. Find the amazing in the margins. I love that. Find the amazing in the margins, the cultural presence. Again, something super meaningful to me, lifetime interaction. Nothing replaces human contact. Wish this could be in person. A culture of equity, a culture of community, a culture of intersectionality, of relevance, belonging, Beauty, fun, and action, uh, all of these principles. I, you know, again, I'm just so um, inspired by this and I've been just a fan of yours and just really, you know, I'm watching kind of you curate these spaces and, and really wanting to follow your lead, really. And I know that you were so instrumental um, in, in this manifesto. So, again, I just don't know who else could have been curating this convo about this launch and, and you know, the course in the book. Wow. Oh my God. Thank you so much. Robin. I'm like, I'm like, this is, this is your event, not mine. This is not about, this is not about me, but oh my goodness. I, I appreciate you so much. I mean, I'm, I'm just so thrilled and honored to be brought into this incredible journey that you are beginning that I know is, you know, part of this longer, just beautiful, beautiful quest that you've been on. And I remember when, when we did first meet, it's like the most Bay Area thing to like, I think we met like on bar on the way to SFO or something like that. And I think so. I feel like it was yeah. on the way to the airport, actually. I think yeah, you were about yeah. to catch a flight back to DC, I think. Well, no, nah, I mean, this because this was before I had moved, I, I got my job at Smithsonian. Oh, so you're right. I was either okay. I was either flying back to New York or uh, yeah, I must have been New York because when I met yeah. you, you were beginning your job 
um, at Davis and I was about to leave New York and like live in Beijing for like six months to just like oh my figure, gosh, figure it out. Right. And that's so it. one of the reasons why I sent you a bunch of stuff was because my mm -hmm. parents were moving from their house into an apartment and I was moving to another country and they were like, you can't keep your stuff here. And I was like, what am I going to do with all these chat books? <laughs> what am I going to do with all these student newspapers? And then, and, and I remember distinctly like packing my stuff and just being like, you just got to either give this away or throw it away, Israel, because it's not like you're going to be working in a museum or anything. And then <laughs> like, and then like within that year, I got a job at Smithsonian. And so, um, yeah, but I mean, so, so much of what you're talking about from the very first moment that we met, I just felt like I had found some kin, you know, like I found family and a sense of familiarity in your tone as a scholar, which, you know, I mean, we can talk more about this, but it's, it's kind of lonely in institutions, right? Like yeah. to be for the people to mm -hmm. lead with, with love, right? I mean, shout out to Amado and, mm -hmm. you know, we are guided by love, right? Like mm -hmm. that is such mm -hmm. a mantra to me. And it's something that I know uh, is just difficult for people to process within institutions, right? And so that form of activism to even just like be human in these spaces is something that I constantly think of you as a point of inspiration. So yeah, I'm, I'm just used to be here. I'm excited about you. I'm excited about your book. I appreciate you reading about the Culture Lab Manifesto, but what I want actually uh, for the audience to do is for us to celebrate Robin, if you don't mind, Robin, hold up the book, the full cover so we can see in all its glory. Yeah, yeah, give it up, give it up, give it up. Hey, Second edition. what, 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 they yes, printed yes. it again? What? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and it's just like, it's like, there's no escaping what this is about. So like, <laughs> I'm, I'm curious, like, I mean, I want to talk about why I find Asian American studies and ethnic studies important, but I want to hear from you first, like, you know, what is it as a, as a scholar, as someone who has, has been navigating community, family, institutions, and everything in between, like, what is it about Asian American studies that, that you feel you, you want to convey? to the people that are going to take this course and read your book? Sure. I mean, you know, I'll never forget um, the impact my very first Asian American Studies course had on me. I had just transferred to UC Santa Barbara. I was sort of hopping around to community colleges before that. And I walked into a class on Asian American women and feminism. And I was like, well, first off, what Asian American women and feminism on a course catalog <laughs> in a university? Like, what is that about? Of course, I'm signing up for that. And then in walks in this totally energetic, you know, faculty member I'd never seen, right? An Asian American woman at the lectern ever like that until I encountered Dr. Diane Fugino. And I just was blown away. And, you know, I think within weeks, you know, part of the syllabus was not just to read about sweatshop workers in LA's garment district. It was an invitation to go to LA to participate in a rally in support of uh, uh, Asian garment workers fight for better wages and working conditions. And I said, yay, I'll, I'll, I'll I'll sign up for that and I'll hop in that car with you and go to that rally in LA. And it completely changed my life. It was funny too, because we were protesting Jessica McClintock um, at the time. It was a big campaign that the Korean immigrant workers, I think Korean immigrant workers advocates, Kiwa was leading and it was a, against this Jessica McClintock. And if you were in the Bay, like in the nineties, like, you know, you went to the Jessica McClintock outlet in San Francisco to get your prom dress. And yes, <laughs> my prom dress was from Jessica McClintock. And to just make this personal connection to actually come to new understanding that this dress that I had bought from the outlet had likely been produced under such exploitative labor conditions and to make that connection. Mm -hmm. So it changed my life. It changed in so many ways. It introduced me, gave me a language to make sense of my experiences as a Filipina uh, growing up in the East Bay. I didn't feel as if I had a language to make sense of 
what the gaps were in our curriculum, right? The fact that I look around me in my classroom and you know what it was like, Adriel, right? Growing up in, in Union City, there are classrooms mm -hmm. where majority folks of color. Um, so you look around you and this is our experience that the teacher in front of the class may or, you know, likely isn't a person of color. And then finding, if you found yourself in, the, in any of the books, you know, it might be a scant few sentences or so. And to then be mm -hmm. introduced to this whole, um, you know, to a field that had at, by that time been several decades old, right? Mm -hmm. It wasn't as if here growing up in Union City, just a stone's throw, throw really from the ground zero for the ethnic studies fight at San Francisco State. And to think that, you know, I didn't even have that opportunity it was life-changing. So I guess for me, Asian American hmm. studies, um, I want to offer that opportunity, that life-changing experience to anybody. I want to be able to provide Asian Americans, other folks of color, this language that ha is not yet, still not yet available to us to be able to both articulate the things that we experience living in a white supremacist society, um, to give us the tools to be able to name it, to understand its their origins, maybe to also be inspired by how our communities have come together to challenge that and to create something different. So, mm -hmm. you know, I want I want to be able to do that. And, you know, so coming to Davis, that was um, it was exciting to be able to finally devote my time as an educator to this kind of curriculum. But I also recognized some of its limits that at the end of the day, still, I could only ever be able to teach Asian American studies to anybody who might possibly have gotten admitted to UC Davis, which of course mm -hmm. is an incredibly challenging thing now, right? It's so competitive. So if you mm -hmm. happen to get admitted and then if and you expensive. happen to have space and expensive, right? <laughs> um, and so, you know, of course I'd been doing all of this work. I mean, you know, I'm also a community organizer. Anybody in the community want me to come through and talk? I did it. I was doing it all the time. It was like I had, you know, multiple jobs um, that I was sort of, juggling and because I'm committed to the project, right? Asian American studies for me isn't just about, you know, the field I happen to be teaching in or writing in as a scholar. To me, it's a political project, right? Mm. So my commitment to it far extends what be, you know, beyond the scope of what my job is. Um, but yeah, I don't want to do that anymore. I don't want to have to yeah. have competing loyalties. If there's an opportunity and thankfully, mm -hmm. oddly, you know, in the pandemic, there's been this new opportunity to just offer it up to the community. Just why do I have to have the university mediate that? Why don't I just give it directly to our folks in the community? That's sort of, you know, what prompted this decision to launch this course and hopefully more in the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, just bring up Union City and, you know, shout out James Logan. Hey. And, you know, oh. I mean, I, like you said, I grew up in, um, you know, in the Bay in the 90s. And so I was in such a bubble, right? Like KML, you you know, like they had like Kai and, you know, like all these like Filipino R&B groups. Buffy, you, right? and then, yeah, and then it was like, you know, Rufio's on hook. I was just like, I was like, what do you mean underrepresented, right? And like everywhere you go, there's like a Filipino restaurant or grocery store or something. And so I remember it wasn't until college when I started traveling around more, around the country. And I, I remember the first time I ever went to Chicago and met some other college students. I was going to Davis at the time. And I was like, what do you mean you don't have Asian American studies? Cause like at Logan, we had Asian American studies. Yeah, we had not only Asian American studies, we had Asian American storytelling. And I didn't take none of them because I was just under the impression that why do I have to go to a class to learn about me? Other people need to come and learn about me, right? And, and so it really wasn't until college, I think I had a similar experience to you. I, I walked into Dr. Bill Hing's class for Asian American Studies 1. And the only reason why I even registered for that was because I couldn't get into whatever engineering class I was, <laughs> I was trying to get into. And it just changed my life. I changed my major. You know, like I ended up majoring in community and regional development, minoring in Asian American Studies. And I think that those two fields combined really, really gave me this, this lived sense of me being an artist, me being an activist, and me being um, a student and scholar could all be a part of one thing instead of sort of segmented, right? I think that that's, that's one of the beautiful things about critical ethnic studies is like you're really learning that 
is not just a subject matter, right? Like this is really lifting the veil on how systems and processes work and affect every single aspect of our lives. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. So I'm, I'm curious about like accessibility, especially, especially these days, right? I mean, you have higher education and all the barriers into a higher education um, curriculum or even resources or access to scholars if you, for one reason or another, are, are not going to college. And then on top of that, we have this pandemic, which is permanently shifting a lot of the ways that we think about how, how we receive each other, right? Um, I mean, we're, we're all waiting for the day that we can really kind of like see each other face to face. But at the same time, I think it's really revealed a lot of the things that were inaccessible about classroom settings and human to human contact even prior to the pandemic. So what does what does accessibility mean to you? And, and I'm really curious, like, wh where do you feel like there's these possibilities that, that maybe you didn't have access to or that frustrated you while you were in academia? Sure. I mean, maybe I'll start backwards with just the frustration. I mean, again, I think we've talked a little bit about, you know, what it means in terms of inaccessibility. Uh, you know, inaccessibility, uh, the inaccessibility of higher education for, for many, many people. Uh, so that's, there's that, whether it's kind of the admissions process to just even being able to afford it. And so part of what I've tried to do in terms of making ethnic studies or critical ethnic studies more accessible has been fighting the fight to change policy, because that's really where uh, we might be able to kind of impact, right? Um, the availability and the accessibility of, of Asian American studies, but it's been a long and drawn out fight. Um, I mean, on one hand, it's been fantastic. There's been some major moves and thank, you know, I'm so, so, I feel so blessed that we came from a community where actually I think one of, among the first ethnic studies departments were, was created. So Asian, I think Logan, James Logan High School, Union City, California, I believe is the very first or among the first high schools to establish ethnic studies, you know? And actually, I think it was initial, some of the first classes came not long after I graduated. So, you know, um, I think um, all, all of the educators in Union City, I think for, for still planting those critical um, kind of seeds in my head, but, mm -hmm. But yeah, you know, I mean, but that was in the 90s and it's taken so much time to advocate on the local level, to get districts to really recognize the importance of ethnic studies, to institute policies, to mandate ethnic studies. It's been such a long and drawn out, drawn out struggle at the state level. Obviously, we know that uh, there's a big fight in other states around basically illegalizing what we think of here in the California context as critical um, ethnic studies that others have labeled, right? critical race theory, and there's a lot of, you know, overlap, and uh, of course, between the two. But yeah, so accessibility for me is it needs to be what, what what's stopping us from from offering a critical ethics studies lens in mm. America to a pre K or pre kindergarten preschool person, mm. you know, I think mm. ethnic studies is you know, it is the experience that has been actively invisibilized and marginalized. Uh, and then is very much a part of the fabric of what is what it means to live in America. And, and so, you know, for me, yeah, what the opportunities that opened up uh, with at least new kind of technologies that have allowed us to be able to offer these knowledges across both time and space is it's exciting, you know, and we actually you know, part of the initial uh, move, you know, I made last year or kind of at the height, at the very beginning of the pandemic was even just offering access to some of the courses I was teaching at the time to a broader public. And, you know, it was really, really overwhelming to see just how, how many people uh, wanted to sign up. There was so much desire. And I think that was also uh, fueled too by, it, you know, the murder of George Floyd, I think, uh, and the heightening and the increase of anti-Asian hate, discrimination and violence. I think that for many communities of color, certainly even for Asian Americans, a new, you know, if for Asian Americans, white supremacy hadn't been so salient in our lives, because so many ways were recruited by white supremacy as a model minority, right, to either mm -hmm. deny the significance of white supremacy, right, mobilized and recruited, you know, against Black people, I think, you know, between 
the murder of George Floyd and, and the, the massive protest movements um, in response to that, but also anti-Asian hate, and violence and discrimination as a consequence of COVID-19, right? And the, the framing of, of COVID-19. I think all of this was like a perfect storm and, and that incited a lot of people. I think had lots of people start questioning, well, what is it? Uh, how do I name these things, right? I think there was this, um, people can observe and see all of these uh, you know, um, issues kind of transpiring in front of them, but also not having the critical tools to make sense of them, to understand, well, where does this come from? How can I better understand the roots of this, the broader impacts of this? How do I change that, right? And so um, I wanna be able to, to offer that more. And again, there are certain constraints. I mean, there's only so much one can do um, from the ivory tower. It really is an yeah. ivory tower. I feel like yeah. it's guarded by centuries, you know what I mean? And there's only mm -hmm. so much entry in and there's only so much we can even extend out. And, you know, I kind of want to just step out and, and take mm -hmm. advantage of, um, you know, and, and, you know, it's been, and I'm taking a lead too from, I think people like you, people who, who rethought about museums, you know, have really kind of exploded our ideas about how we think, um, you know, museums or other kinds of spaces ought to function, you know? And mm -hmm. so trying to, to take some cues from, I think, artists like you, um, other folks who, who have creatively approached, um, you know, the extension, uh, the extending of knowledge and creating of learning experiences um, mm -hmm. that um, I think are just simply not fully possible in a university context. Yeah, I mean, so much of what you're saying lands on, you know, like it just resonates so much because, you know, so I've been working at Smithsonian now for almost eight years now and yeah. or over eight years now. And, you know, I, I follow your stories and your posts and stuff. And I know that you, you've been speaking on imposter syndrome within the institution. And, you know, I want to I've been wanting to talk to you about it because it's like there's the imposter syndrome within the institution of like you're, you're coming from kind of an unconventional background or you're coming with different philosophies. But I also have been thinking about an idea of like an invader syndrome, which is like, you know, like once I became a curator and started, you know, I got, you know, got this business card and this title, I felt like when I'm in community where I have always just been at ease, like now I feel like, oh, am I, you know, like, am I being received differently now because I've got this curatorial title, right? And I think that really one of the important things if you're working in an institution is to know when to cash out and distribute back to community, right? Because, I mean, we all know people who have been down for the cause and then they, they go into an institution and then they just sort of disappear, right? Um, and I think that that's that's really something that I admire about you is is seeing that you you you've got your eye on community. You even even while you've been working at you know this ivory tower, you've you've had your eye on community and and you've been scheming for ways to bring this back to the people who don't have access, right? And and it's not just people who can't go to college. I mean, or don't go to college. It's like I mean, people who have been to college but didn't take mm -hmm. ethnic studies, yeah. people who are in college, but they've been through this pipeline so much that they feel like they can't afford the units to take a course mm -hmm. like this, you know, and 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 especially given how, you know, like ethnic studies has been around for over 50 years, but the way that I think the public envisions what Asian American studies is or must be, I feel like could really, you know, use some, some continued evolution. So I think especially when we're thinking about like, you know, at the Smithsonian, I'm pretty outspoken about how I feel like we're not quite ready yet for a museum. And I think part of it is because there's still this representation politics based kind of idea that like the existence of a museum or entry into an institution means that we've made it right. But then like within that framework, there's like, you know, what's considered like intro intro topics or intro communities, right? And so it's like, you learn about Chinese, Japanese, Korean first, and then maybe you learn about Filipino, Vietnamese, and then you learn about Hmong, you know, and it's like, why does it have to be like that, right? And I think that, that there's there's a question about accessibility in that way too, if yeah. you feel like you found Asian American studies, but then even within that field, you feel underrepresented. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's why, you know, part of what, well, first, you know, part of what 
the struggle for me was, uh, I felt like, again, I was juggling multiple jobs, you know, I, mm-hmm. because I think part of, I, I could see, it, you know, I'm a sociologist, right? So on some level, I understand like socialization and I know what happens. It's like, you can have folks who are down, you know, they've been doing all this work in the community, the inner doctoral program. I mean, that's mm-hmm. like, you know, and then go and then wait for tenure. I mean, that's a process of socialization, of re-socialization. And mm-hmm. unless you're maintaining, a, you know, kind of um, your communities um, in, in, you know, that, that might have motivated this desire to go in academia to begin with, um, and, and, and sustaining those connections requires relationship building, right, right, work, you know, effort. And um, if you are setting that aside with hopes that one day after you're situated, which is like after tenure, which is what, after like almost a decade, you think you're not gonna mm-hmm. change? Of course you're gonna change. And so I think for me, it was like, okay, I can see that can happen. So I'm gonna put my, you know, put this energy here still too, but it also was draining, you know, and mm-hmm. I couldn't do that. I can't sustain this. And I think it took the pandemic too, to kind of think, oh, I actually don't have to anymore. There may well be another way Mm -hmm. to go about doing this. And so, Mm -hmm. you know, I feel like part of what I want to be able to do is to be able to co-create curriculum. I mean, clearly, you know, on some level at the beginning for this course, you know, it is based on what was written as an academic book, but it's not going to be exclusively based on that. You know, Mm -hmm. we already kind of have a pre-registration you know, link out there. So I've been really paying attention to how people are, are talking about wanting to come into this space and trying to mm-hmm. kind of be responsive to that, to, to find a way that we might be able to co-create. You know, I think maybe not in this pilot course, but I think in the future. And again, because I'll be, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm moving towards really, you know, leaving the university fully. I'm not out yet, but I'm moving towards that end. I feel like I can do so much pedagogically in ways that I couldn't before. Um, to bring in, you know, different insights to, uh, um, with respect to how to go about um, teaching, you know, mm-hmm. um, and, and, you know, what to teach, not just the how, mm-hmm. but also the what, because two, I think there's a way in which Asian American studies or ethnic studies knowledge, you know, there are some knowledges that we haven't been centering, at least kind mm-hmm. of, you know, more recently, you know, I mean, as the fields got more established, there were certain different kinds of knowledges that weren't put at the center in the way that they might've been at the very beginnings of, of um, you know, the formations of both those fields. So, you know, I'm really, really hoping that as I move further and further away and into this new role, you know, I'm kind of calling myself like the people's professor in a way I really want to be yeah, yeah. and to really, <laughs> you know, kind of co-create mm-hmm. these learning experiences. You know, for now, I think we're going to we're going to be digital. It's going to be, you know, I'm going to play with different formats from asynchronous uh, and synchronous. So for this course, it's really like a short course, like a quick and dirty. You know, I really mm-hmm. had actually, to be honest, but I really had teachers in mind when I designed this course. My, mm-hmm. my thinking mm-hmm. was in, in, you know, you have all of these debates about critical race theory, all this pushback against ethnic studies. I just want to, and I'm still in the fight. You know, I, I, I had to miss a meeting because mm-hmm. I've, I'm part of an ethnic studies advisory uh, committee for the Twin Rivers um, Unified School District up here in the Sacramento region. I'm also part of it, I'm trying to connect with other folks in my community. I live in Elk Grove right now who are also part of an ethnic studies coalition. So I'm still in the fight. I still want to push. But I yeah. also know that that will take time. And in mm-hmm. the meantime, and there will be pushback and then we will only, we may never get the thing we want. We might get parts of it. So at least mm-hmm. I want to be able to put it out there and say, teachers, y'all don't have to wait. You can have yeah, a quick yeah. course. I want to try to keep it, you know, um, to give you just an overview, to give you some of the basic overview of like, how did we get here? You know, what, what's mm-hmm. going on in your students' lives, right? Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Give you a, a better sense, you know, especially if you're like an Asian American teacher, you haven't had the opportunity to take Asian American studies, you're serving Asian American communities, right? But you don't, mm-hmm. you know, you're not fully understanding maybe kind of the broader context of your, your learners, your students' lives, the parents that you serve. Maybe you just need it for yourself, you know? So, so mm-hmm. the idea really was kind of teachers, you can knock this out, hopefully, like in a weekend, it's really only designed to be about 10 hours of content. So that's not 10 hours of lecture, but it's like, although if you can listen to me for 10 hours, you know, I guess I could probably <laughs> talk for 10 hours, but 
but be chopped up between kind of mm -hmm. um, lectures, uh, exercises, um, reading, mm -hmm. about 10 hours, um, just so that people can kind of, kind of whet their appetites, but also to have some of that working knowledge that might be, you know, useful in this moment. And, you know, the longer term vision is to develop, you know, uh, fully fledged uh, courses on different topics. You know, I want to start in, you know, my area of expertise, which has been kind of Asian American studies and Philippine studies. But, you know, a lot of my work like you has been about kind of Asian Black kind of solidarity and coalition and kind of interracial solidarity and coalition. Um, and, um, and I really want to be able to kind of offer that uh, mm -hmm. more. You know, one of the big initiatives that I helped lead was the University for Justice and Liberation last year in partnership mm -hmm. with the People's Collective uh, for Justice and Liberation. And, you know, that was a kind of experiment too with like, how do you do kind of political education around, you know, cross-racial or interracial solidarity and using, you know, um, not just the platform, the virtual platform, but bringing in the knowledges, not only of scholars, but of organizers, of artists, right, um, to help, um, you know, shape this, uh, uh, this curriculum. And so, you know, I'd like to be able to kind of continue um, in that vein. But for now, you know, the course is that a very, very short course, a really cursory introduction. It's not going to be able to do everything for folks, but at least, you know, for now, it's a starting uh, off point. Um, there is a fee, you know, I'm trying to, you know, um, we, we still have operating expenses here, you know, because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. of course, when I was doing a lot of the community work, a lot of that was volunteer. And, you know, it, once I extract myself from the university space fully, we're still going to have operating costs, but I want to be able to keep it, you know, as affordable as possible, create opportunities for folks um, to have, you know, to participate however they can on the sliding scale, kind of just talk about, you know, there'll be options, but, you know, after operating expenses are, are paid, really the idea is the, the revenue generated from the course is gonna go back into the, to movements. You know, I, mm -hmm. I work very closely with um, the, what's now called the Sacramento API Regional Network. It's, it's transitioning and transforming and becoming the Asian American Liberation Network. Of course, mm -hmm. I wanna be able to give uh, um, or, uh, money to, um, organizations I care about, like Asians for Black Lives, um, the movement for Black Lives, even just, you know, continue to support Indigenous people's struggles in the Philippines, where, of course, Amato um, spent his last, you know, moments in life with serving alongside and fighting with them. And, you know, I want to be able to, to do that kind of work, unrestricted money for all of these movements to just go, because, mm -hmm. you know, we're often to beholden to foundations or the state. Um, you know, this can be an opportunity for at least some funding and want to be able to fund, you know, and bankroll, you know, some of these amazing creative projects we've long kind of been dreaming about, Adriel. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, you know, that's what I'm hoping that the course does too, you know, puts out that mm -hmm. knowledge, makes it relatively accessible for folks, affordable. And then, you know, we'd redistribute any of, um, anything we earn back into the movements we care about, you know? Mm -hmm. No, I mean, I think what I, what I love about this is that the course isn't just about Asian American studies, like, and it's not just about Asian American activism. It, it is Asian American activism, right? Like you've got, you've got a mutual aid economic format baked yep. into this. You've got, you know, uh, you're, you're, you're starting, starting it off with solidarity, which I think is just so important because, Oftentimes, ethnic studies and all the various departments can be looked at sort of like this piecemeal kind of a thing, right? Mm -hmm. And I think it's just so important for, for people to be able to understand that, for example, you know, like you're talking about Asian American history of immigration, but also settlement, right? And so, I mean, it's been like 15 years since I've been an Asian American studies student, but we, in my courses, you know, settler colonialism was not a huge point of discussion. Yeah, and, and, I, and I think it's so important because it's like, that's not being talked about in history classes um, in a conventional education. And if it's even relatively new in ethnic studies, how are people um, supposed to come to a conclusion that, you know, you, you kind of learn about this as this interwoven dynamic among all these different oppressed peoples, right? So um, I, I, th I think it's really beautiful. And I, I just congratulate you so much because I think what you're doing is 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 incredible, and and the fact that it's also a, a collaborative co-creation, you know, format. I think is also just further testament to the fact that like 
what people are getting is not just through listening to you speak or reading the material, but also just kind of seeing how you do, right? And seeing that what you're doing is a part of a continued legacy. Asian American studies comes out of academia, but also comes out of care work. It also comes out of artists. It also comes out of activists. And I feel like that's just in the DNA of this course. So yeah, uh, just so excited to see to see how it goes. Thank you so much. Well, you also, I need to, I want to hear from you about all of the stuff you're cooking up because I feel like once I listen to you, I walk away with yet more inspiration and ideas. So mm. what are you up to? Thank you so much for, you know, talking about this project with me, but I'd love to also hear about what you're, what you're working on, Adriel, kind of just you, but also in the context of your, your job at, at the Smithsonian. Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, so so for folks who might not be as familiar, the Smithsonian Asian Pacific American Center is dedicated to uh, Pacific Islander and Asian American experiences. And um, so much, sorry if you hear my dryer. It's okay, I heard the time. laundry. Good. It's a very yeah. cute well, time for the, you I know, like that all that, <laughs> you know, like get it all done. So, um, <laughs> Uh, so, so the Asian Pacific American Center of the Smithsonian, we're, we're not a museum. There are some initiatives towards building a museum, but one of the things that my colleagues and I are really interested in is establishing a critical framework, establishing one that does not prioritize certain ethnic groups or certain genders or certain identities over others when we're talking about a holistic coalition of Asian Pacific American, right? Like um, I see Asian Pacific America not as a demographic, not as uh, race. It's a coalition like mm -hmm. Pacific Islanders and Asian Americans from such vastly different regions, different cultures. But what brings us together is our free will to decide that we are going to bind together. Right. And so how do we enforce that as an understanding um, as opposed to sort of being like, I guess we're learning about this because we were all thrown into this together. Right. Mm -hmm. Like we, we have a lot more power than that. And, and so a lot of my work is centered around um, going back to our roots and recognizing that. So the main topics that I've been focusing on, one is around health and healing. And so um, I work a lot with artists and especially over the pandemic, I've seen so many artists who have gravitated towards meditation, mindfulness, um, you know, things that have often been detached and detached decontextualize in American culture from their Asian roots, right? Like mm -hmm. you think about yoga, you think about breath work, all this stuff that has been corporatized. And so uh, a lot of the projects I'm working on is about demystifying the connections and, and really strengthening that, um, working with artists who are seeking. And then as a curator, my job is to provide resources, do some research, which has been great for myself and my own healing practice. And then, and then the other big topic that I've been focusing on, which is very connected, is environmental stewardship, right? And so that goes to, you know, again, going back to our roots and understanding that, like, you know, for example, a lot of the narrative of Asian American activism is this insistence that we belong here, right? Um, and I understand the philosophy of it. It's something that was behind for a very long time, but to, to be in the US, to be on Turtle Island and just insist I belong here, right? There's a lot of colonialness to it, right? And so I'm, I'm really interested in um, finding historical and present and also future avenues of Asian indigenous solidarity. And so we look to our Pacific Islander um, you know, cousins and see ways that their understandings of the environment, their understandings of gender um, can, can really lead us towards a more free future. And then we look at spaces like, like Utah or like look at how um, you know, the transcontinental railroad was also about a lot of resource extraction, was also a lot um, you know, like, I mean, we were, we were blowing up mountains and in Asian American studies, we learn about the violence against the Chinese miners who were hurt by the mining process and who were left out of like the golden spike photo, but we don't really learn a lot about how we were participating in this settler colonial um, excursion, right? Or we think about native folks who were displaced or whose labor was used in order to build the incarceration camps for Japanese Americans during World War II, right? Like there's so much interconnection with, um, with our native brothers and sisters and kinfolk. And so I'm, I'm really interested in also highlighting the 
you know, a lot of the emerging scholarship and a lot of the historical scholarship that's come out of Asian American studies and, and also native studies around these connections. Um, so, so yeah, basically it sounds like we're, we're kind of in a very similar lane. Yeah, <laughs> no, I'm so, I'm so excited by all of that, um, you know, and just looking forward to being able to actually collab um, in a deep kind of way. And I think, I feel like, you know, moving in, in this direction kind of out of the ivory tower gives me that much more space, liberates mm -hmm. me to be able to collaborate in the ways that I wasn't really quite able to do within the confines of the university, you know, because part of it is that, you know, how, what's valued, what isn't valued. And, and so I'm, I'm really excited about what you have planned and can't wait to have another conversation about, you know, what that can look like for the both of us. But again, mm -hmm. thank you so mm -hmm. much, Adriel, for, for um, being part of this conversation about uh, this um, new course and this new initiative. And, yeah. you know, um, I will continue to look to you as a thought partner in this whole process because I, you know, I, I know that, um, you know, this, this process of developing this curriculum really does require, um, you know, this kind of collective um, kind of, it, it requires community. In the, mm -hmm. in the way that I think Asian American studies, you know, I think, you know, that's what its origins were always kind of in the collective, in, in the in yeah. community, in, in multiple kinds of, in multiple voices, um, mm -hmm. right? Not that, you know, really about the margins and, and the bringing together of people across uh, within and between the margins. So um, again, thanks again, and um, hopefully, you know, we'll see, we'll be able to collab soon.